Today on The Grave Talks, we continue our conversation with Chicago paranormal investigator, Tony Zabelski. Tony's a longtime Chicago paranormal investigator and works with Chicago Hauntings. If you missed the first part of our conversation, make sure you check that out. Today on this episode of The Grave Talks, we're going to talk about some of Chicago's most haunted locations with Chicago Hauntings ghost tour guide, Tony Zabelski. And Tony, Chicago has such a rich history, and you can't talk about Chicago's history without talking about the gangster history. And probably the most famous site, the one that everyone's heard about, is the St. Valentine's Day Massacre site. And I wanted to talk about that today. When you go there, you don't see a lot these days, but apparently it's haunted. Oh, definitely. And and thanks again, Carol, for having me on. And uh, going back to that point you mentioned about how you can't really, you know, for one, be a tour guide in Chicago without know about knowing about the gangster history. Um, it does come up on almost every tour. We do tours that go out to the suburbs, and it comes up on suburban tours. I did a combined two years in a row tour with the Chicago Pizza Tour guy. Uh, we go; it's like pizza and ghost hunting. Uh, we go to a couple of pizzerias and then a couple of haunted stops. And he even talked about Prohibition era gangsters and their ties to some of well, what eventually became the pizzerias in the city. Definitely, you know, this is all very tied in to Chicago and its history. Uh, but yeah, uh, the St. Valentine's Day massacre. I mean, you think about it, one of the reasons why, at least I personally believe that site to be haunted, is you have seven people that were brutally murdered that morning gunned down uh, by, you know, Tommy gun fire. Uh, And it is still to this day, an unsolved mystery as to who shot these men. And they're definitely unavenged murders. So that in itself would make you think the spirits would stay there and be restless. Mm -hmm. Plus there's definitely a belief that um, if you want to subscribe to the theory of why some spirits might stick around is especially if you were raised Catholic, like a lot of these gangsters were the belief is that, you know, being Catholic, you're told that if you're not a good person here on earth, that eventually when you die, you're going to go straight to hell and you're going to burn in hell. If these guys believe this, that could be one of the reasons why they stick around at the you know sites where they were killed. They're fearful of like, you know, being judged on the other side because the things that they did in life weren't, you know, too, too good. Cause it seems like every gangster related site, we have some activity there of old gangsters coming through. And that particular day after the massacre happened, and you mentioned Tommy guns, it would have been mm-hmm. loud. There was a lot oh, of shots yeah. fired that day. Oh, definitely. But yet it took police several hours to respond to it Mm -hmm. because they had a decoy police car or something. Like people thought the police had arrived, but the police hadn't arrived. So they weren't calling the police. What pulled up in front of that garage that morning about 1030 was a Chicago police car. And they say at least four men got out of the car. There may have been some others staked out around the building. Uh, but at least four men get out of the car. Two of the guys dressed as police officers, you know, Chicago policemen, uh, two others in regular clothing. And what goes in the front entrance of that garage is two Chicago, looks like two Chicago policemen with the car parked in front. And then after all the loud machine gun fire, which, yeah, that's right in the middle of a neighborhood. People would have heard all this loud Tommy gun fire. What people witness is what looks like two police officers handcuffing and walking out into the police car and then jumping in the front seat and turning the lights and sirens on and taking off. It looked to everybody that, you know, whatever disturbance happened in the garage causing all that loud gunfire that the police are there, have the situation under control, have the guys who did the shooting and that's that. It's all over. Go back to what you were doing. It was only because of a dog and the constant barking of a dog that alerted a lady who uh, owned the building next door when she came home about three hours later. 
And she keeps wondering why this dog is constantly barking and moaning and no one's doing anything to comfort this dog. Uh, she's fearful of going in the building by herself to see what's going on. So she talks to one of her neighbors and they go together into the building. And you can only imagine what they see when they open the door to that garage. The guy who was with her just runs out onto the street screaming that there are dead people everywhere in here. So, I mean, that in itself would definitely cause hauntings. Some still report hearing, like the, the, the sounds of a dog barking there and machine gun fire, men moaning and falling to the ground. Uh, the apartment building that the lady lived in is still there right next to it's a, the garage is long gone torn down in 1967 and the city's effort to get rid of all the gangster related sites. Uh, but the apartment building next door is still there. And I do know the owner of that building who's owned it for about 20 years. And uh, he comes down to talk to us when he sees me there with tour groups. Sometimes he just recently, like a week ago, he's, I had like a small group on a walking tour, like six people. And he came down with little water bottles and said, you guys all look thirsty. <laughs> he gave us the water bottles. But <laughs> He says that there's poltergeist activity in a lot of the apartments with things flying off the shelf as tenants report that or, you know, falling off of counters for no reason. The building, the opposite side of it is a senior citizens facility on the opposite side of where the garage would have been. And the, that property where the garage was is now the property of the senior living facility. And again, there are stories of people looking out the windows at night and seeing what looked like the old time gangsters roaming around over there, and like the suits and the hats that they they wore. They they say if you go out there on the anniversary date, Valentine's Day, specifically though, on Valentine's Day after a fresh snowfall, that you have to have those two things working together. You can see the outline of the gangsters' bodies where they fell in the snow. Oh no, that's creepy. It, it, extremely. There was one that two ladies stayed in over different time periods. Uh, and both of these ladies reported looking in their mirror in that room and seeing what looked like an old time gangster, you know, wearing one of those fedora hats that they used to wear and uh, the suits uh, looking back at her through the mirror. She gets kind of tired of them looking at her. So she gets an old dress and hangs it up over the mirror. So it at least blocked them out. I had, I don't think I'd have any mirrors in my apartment if that was going on. <laughs> I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I'm assuming when they tore it down, or maybe it happened right after the slayings, that people were taking bricks. Oh, definitely, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I've heard there's the, some association, you know, with some paranormal activity in the bricks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they said the bricks became collectors' items after that was torn down in 1967. I actually just recently did a, uh, with a couple of people I know who own one of those bricks. Uh, we did an event where we talked about the same, it was back in February. We talked about the St. Valentine's Day massacre. And then we did like a little seance around the brick at, at a restaurant in, in this area. Uh, but yeah, they said people who initially got those bricks, a number of them were experiencing weird things like hauntings all of a sudden started in their homes or they were getting in like terrible accidents or horrible diseases, uh, losing like huge money and in, in investments and things like that or going through a, otherwise like, would seem like a good marriage was all of a sudden started you know, went bad and then you're going through a divorce. It just seemed like something bad was happening to everybody. I'd be getting rid of that brick. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then they said the people didn't want the bricks anymore. Yeah, businessman from the town of Vancouver, British Columbia started buying these bricks from these people. He wanted to, up in Vancouver, reassemble the wall in a gangster-themed bar and restaurant that he was going to be opening in downtown Vancouver, which the man eventually does. He calls the place the Banjo Palace, reassembles the wall in the men's bathroom of the bar. Uh, he does let ladies in to see this wall. The stories say that what the man actually did in that bathroom is he puts plexiglass in front of the bricks, reassembles the wall, puts plexiglass in front of them, and the men were supposed to aim their pee toward the bullet holes. Oh, I wasn't quite ready for that. Yeah, that, that place probably was cursed also because it doesn't end up lasting too long. 
But a good majority of the bricks from that wall are reassembled today, and they're located in the Mobster Museum out in Las Vegas. They say that they're haunted, that they hear, you know, again, the phantom gunshots and men moaning and falling to the ground around them. That's kind of, that is actually the perfect place for them to be, I think. Oh, it is, definitely, yeah. So when you go to that site now, there's really nothing to see. It's just an empty field. Yeah. In Chicago, you know, there's not a lot of lots that size and that big, but apparently nobody either wants to build on it or... Well, the word I'm hearing is that the city won't allow anybody to build on it. Oh, because you don't see a lot of property that size with nothing on it. No, and and Lincoln Park is an expensive neighborhood to live in in the city, and that's where it's located and very prime real estate. But um, I'm hearing that they don't want anybody to use that address or that location again. It's just going to be the like this grassy area and little parking lot between the nursing home and the apartment building. The Lincoln Park Old City Cemetery, you mentioned Mm -hmm. that. And I thought, my dad lived not too far from there. And I was like, a cemetery. So I looked it up and then I saw a tomb and I know exactly where you're talking about. I had no idea there was a cemetery there, let alone this very interesting history about this cemetery right there. So I'm going to let you share that. Yeah, starting in 1843, with the rapid growth of Chicago, they had to give a couple tiny little cemeteries in what would have been close to like the lakefront back in the day. Uh, one of them, if you know what the Chicago Water Tower building is, mm-hmm. that uh, that used to be a cemetery at one point. Oh, uh, where, where another place called McCormick Place is right over there used to be a cemetery, but. City growing rapidly, they decide that they need to find a bigger patch of land for a burial ground, and they want it away from where the general population is living at this time, late 1830s, early 1840s. Uh, So they choose some marshland along the shore of Lake Michigan uh, to open as Chicago City Cemetery. Eventually, it becomes four different cemeteries, the City Cemetery, a Catholic Cemetery, a Jewish Cemetery, and a Potter's Field where poor would have been buried in unmarked graves. And the cemetery would have stretched from what is current day Schiller Street in what would be considered the Gold Coast neighborhood of Chicago. And it would have stretched all the way through the area where the Lincoln Park Zoo is to the grounds of the cemetery went to what would be Webster Avenue today, which is about a block past the St. Valentine's Day Massacre site. That's a big area. It is. That's now, big. there weren't too, most of the, the concentration of most of the burials would have been from about Schiller Street to where the Lincoln Park Zoo is today. Uh, they might have buried a few further out, but that was land that the cemetery did own, just that they hadn't at that point buried anybody, too many over there. The cemetery is only around for about 20 years. They, till the they it actually technically they closed the cemetery in the year 1859, but many reports say they were still burying bodies out there in the 1860s up until late 1860s. Um, they closed the city cemetery mainly because of its spreading disease diseases like cholera, because the bodies were buried in this marshland close to the Lake Michigan shoreline. And when we'd get the high tide coming in, it would actually wash the caskets back ashore. And decomposing bodies were getting into Lake Michigan. And Lake Michigan was the drinking and water supply as it is today. So people were like actually drinking decomposing human remains. And this was causing the spread of disease, including several cholera epidemics that broke out throughout the city. Um, a doctor was urging the city sem- the uh, city council to close the city cemetery, which eventually they do do. They decide because it's spreading disease. And I think more so because a lot of people started to move to that area and real estate values were being dropped uh, simply because it was so close to this ugly cemetery with caskets washing ashore and body parts laying all over the place that the city finally decides to close it. Um, They were going to relocate the bodies to newer cemeteries um, 
There's Graceland and Rose Hill cemeteries on the north side, Oakwoods on the south side, Calvary Cemetery up in Evanston, that they were going to start moving these bodies to. Um, but they only, and this is like 1868, they only bring in a crew of 10 men to start moving what many estimate about 35,000 bodies. And this is with shovels. <laughs> Now, there's no modern digging equipment that exists yet. So 10 men could maybe get three or four a day on a good day? The I city mean, when you think about estimate that. was that they could move 200 bodies a week. That was what the city asked them. Was. 10 guys and shovels. 10 guys with shovels. We're not even talking backhoes bodies. back then. That was just yeah. a shovel. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. And transporting them because it wouldn't have been as easy as it would be. Horse now. and buggy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Right. So, yeah. So, so obviously, obviously, oh, they didn't remove everybody. The, oh, that no. wouldn't have been possible. So, there still has to be bodies located. There. Yeah. Well, they did start removing the bodies. And by all accounts, that they, you know, the intentions were to re- relocate these bodies. But then October 8th, 1871, the Great Chicago Fire happens, and it just sweeps right through the land where City Cemetery was, and it destroys the majority of the headstones that were left there. It destroys all records of the cemetery and where people were buried. So at that point, they just pretty much gave up. And you know, any it. available funds the city had, they had to use to rebuilding the city itself. So moving bodies out of city cemetery became less of a priority. They just decided they were, they were eventually going to turn it into Lincoln Park. Lincoln Park Zoo actually opened in 1868 before the cemetery really even officially shut down. So they just decided to go ahead with that, just turn it into the, the park and the zoo. By turning it into the park and the zoo, did they build on top of the actual cemetery or just near the actual cemetery? Oh, on top of. Oh. Yeah, they estimate there's about ten to 15,000 bodies, and people throw around different numbers still buried underneath there. And you would never know. No, no. The, the corner of Clark and LaSalle is a parking lot. It's a parking lot for the Lincoln Park Zoo and the Chicago History Museum, which are both right there. Mm-hmm. Uh, they broke ground to build the parking lot in the year 1998. And they dug up 81 caskets in 1998. Oh, wow. So we're talking 25 years ago. So the Lincoln Park Zoo being Next, right there, know. have you heard of hauntings at the zoo? Oh, yeah. I've done investigations at the zoo. And we, uh, in one of our investigations in the barn, in the children's portion of the zoo, where they did find bodies underneath when they were building that in the early 1960s, that part the petting zoo and the children's zoo was built Uh, Dr. Lester Fisher, who was the head of the zoo at the time, uh, found some bodies during construction. And he, notifying the city about these bodies, um, asking them, you know, they're going to take these away. You know, what are you going to do with them? He said he called the city several occasions, leaving them lots of messages, but they never returned his phone calls and never picked up the bodies or did anything with them. So in order not to hold up construction any further, he made a, an executive decision to put the bodies right back where they were found and build the children's zoo up on top of them. So we did get a scream in the barn on a recording device one night on an investigation. Uh, we did capture what looked like a shadow figure in the basement of the lion house in the woman's bathroom, which is down in that basement and considered the most haunted spot in the zoo itself. It seems like more reports of paranormal activity were coming from that bathroom than anywhere. People would um, see there, there's mirrors also on either side of the wall. They're facing each other. And they say you should never put mirrors like that. Cause it creates like a portal as people would report uh, like washing their hands and they look in the mirror and they see someone looking back at them through that mirror, or they'd see in the mirror behind them, someone in that mirror looking like over their shoulder, that bathroom too. some security guards and maintenance men have been working in there and they are security guards making their rounds through there have had something whisper in their ear, like get out or what are you doing here? 
Like the belief is it's a woman's bathroom. You're a man. You shouldn't be in here. So, yeah, definitely, Ahana. Do the, the carousel, the merry-go-round, they said, goes off on its own uh, at night. Security has reported that. Music coming from it. Uh, a little boy spirit's been seen, like, playing throughout the ape house. And we don't really know who he is, but he's been seen there. So, yes, definitely a haunted zoo. I had no idea. And I've been to that mm-hmm. zoo. When I looked it up because I was thinking I didn't know about a cemetery there, so I looked it up. And what I saw was the picture of a tomb, which I'm very familiar mm-hmm. with that. Tell us about that tomb that you can still see there today. Yeah, that is really the only remaining um, mausoleum left from the city cemetery days. It is the Couch Tomb. Uh, It's right on uh, LaSalle and Clark Street, just behind the Chicago History Museum. It was the burial vault of a man named Ira Couch and his family. Ira uh, and his brother James owned a hotel called the Tremont House Hotel. Um, In the previous episode, we just did talking about the Iroquois Theater. Mm -hmm. The alley behind the Iroquois Theater, right behind that alley, is a parking garage today. Uh, Right where the parking garage is, is where the Couch family's hotel would have been at one point, the Tremont House Hotel. The building was built after Ira Couch died while on vacation in Cuba in 1857. The building was built the couch uh, tomb was built in 1858 by uh, his brother James had it constructed out of limestone imported from Lockport, New York. Uh, and it cost $7,000 to build that building in 1858. So that's a good a chunk of money. money. Equal that's- to about $200,000 in today's money. Oh, wow. But there's many, many mysteries surrounding the couch tomb. We really don't know why it was left there in Lincoln Park, when most other remnants of the city cemetery are gone, even the few things that survived the fire, they did end up at least moving the headstone or mausoleum that survived to uh, mostly to Graceland Cemetery on the north side. But nothing really states why they left this particular monument there. There are some estimates that it, it did survive the fire. That's possible one reason why they left it. it. There were some estimates that it could have cost $3,000 in the 1890s to move. So maybe it was just cheaper to keep it there. Um, or maybe they just wanted to leave something to remind people, like the future generations, what the land may have been used for. But really, nobody knows why it was left there. The other mystery is we really don't know if any of the bodies are inside there. They were supposed to have been moved out of there to Rose Hill Cemetery, which the Couch family does have a plot in Rose Hill, which has headstones for Ira Couch and his wife and some of the people believed to be in that mausoleum. But there's no record of them listed in the cemetery records of Rose Hill, even though they have the headstones there. So whether they were moved or not, nobody knows for sure. And the mausoleum itself has not been open since the early 1900s. About 1901, some newspaper articles were found. The park was doing some work around it. They opened it up. A guy who worked in the park claimed that when it was open, he went inside there and that he said it was empty. There was nothing in there. Hmm. But Ira Couch's still living grandson at the time says, no, the guy's wrong. And the grandson names about seven bodies that should be still inside there. But But the debate still kind of rages on today whether the bodies are in there. And he also has another burial site. So which one is it? He can't be in both places. Yeah. I think this is also interesting. So next time you go to the Lincoln Park Zoo or Lincoln Park in Chicago, just know there are bodies underneath where you're walking. I think mm-hmm. that's yeah, definitely. fascinating. I had no idea about that. I mean, if you're walking through Lincoln Park and you realize that just 25 years ago in 1998, they dug up 81 bodies in an area where they put a parking lot in, you know there have to be bodies underneath yes. where you're walking. Absolutely. Now, when mm-hmm. someone is visiting Chicago or even if they're living there right now, how can they take one of your tours? I would highly recommend them because it's so interesting. You get the history and the hauntings. 
Chicago Hauntings, American Ghost Box is the new ownership of it. I give a walking tour in Lincoln Park that starts at the Chicago History Museum, goes into the park, the couch tomb. Uh, we go by the Potter's Field, which is now softball fields, where they believe about 15,000 bodies still, or uh, uh, 5,000 bodies still remain uh, under the softball fields. And we go to the, we go around the parameters of the zoo, and then we eventually make our way to the St. Valentine's Day Massacre site. I give that tour Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday nights. Well, I'm coming up this summer, so I'm going to contact you and we're going to do a tour. Oh, yeah. Sounds good. Then we have the bus tours. I, I, I do another walking tour on South Prairie Avenue in the South Loop on Monday and Wednesdays, which is a stretch of that part of town where a lot of millionaires lived in Chicago, like Marshall Field that we mentioned uh, in the previous episode. Um, and then I do the Devil in the White City tours. Um, do those are usually a daytime Saturday afternoon tour. Um, I also do the Vanishing Hitchhiking Resurrection Mary tours. We've got a seven-hour ghost tour up in Lake County, suburbs north of Chicago. And just on a quick side note, Tony, thank you very much, and go Cubs. Oh, yeah, thank you. Oh, yeah, definitely go Cubs. Go, I'm looking forward to it. Go Cubs. We're both big <laughs> Cubs fans. So I yeah. really, really mm-hmm. appreciate your time today. And if you have well, not listened you. to our first conversation, part one, check that out. It's very interesting. If you'd like access to all of our episodes, including the archive and advanced episodes, everything commercial free, become a gravekeeper. Sign up on Apple Podcasts and you can try it for three days free or go to patreon.com slash the grave talks and find everything there all ad free. For all of us at the grave talks, I'm Carol Hughes and thank you for listening.